Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hi, and welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, filmmaking freedom for the independent. This is a podcast where we focus on making and selling your film for online self-distribution. A perfect way to get started is to pick up the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion, while doing it. It's available as a paperback, in Kindle ebook, as well as an audiobook. In fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com. When you go to that link, you can sign up with Audible for their free trial and get the book for free. Again, that's at survivetheimplosion.com. Okay, here's a quick update of what I've been working on. Um, I'm in the writing phase of things, so I'm just turning my script treatment into a novel, and that's what I plan to get out there in the market first before actually making the film. I'm trying to stay really diligent in my writing and keeping a page count every day in order to make progress. At a certain point, I might actually share a few chapters with you guys, but for those of you who have followed me on Film Trooper know that I'll probably do that in the form of an audiobook presentation uh, to make it much easier for all of you podcast listeners. Anyway, that's the latest, and now on to the episode. Today's episode is entitled, How to Make a Web Series Successful. And I've been wanting to get these two people on my show for some time now. Uh, They are Mercedes Rose and Nick Hagen. They're two-thirds of the team behind the hit YouTube web series, The Haunting of Sunshine Girl. And the third member is the star of the series, the talented young Paige McKenzie. But since we're here to talk about the business side of things, we have Paige's mom, which is Mercedes Rose, who plays Sunshine's mom and is one of the co-creators along with Nick Hagen. And they're here to share how they turned their web series into a book series published by the Weinstein Company and are currently working on the TV show version of the web series. How do they do this? And what can we learn from their experience, which will help us turn our web series into a success? So The Haunting of Sunshine Girl follows Paige, who plays Sunshine, and is someone who is thrust into the middle of these supernatural hauntings and happenings. They launched the series on YouTube at the end of 2010, and within a year, they had amassed a huge following. Now, Nick was working on a paranormal ghost hunter spoof show, and that's where he met Mercedes, who was one of the actors. And Mercedes has been one of the, you know, Portland's top actors. She's been on almost every TV show that has come through this area, including Leverage and Portlandia. Anyway, during the process of making this pilot, Nick recognized that Mercedes had the same drive and focus as he did. So when Nick found out that Mercedes had a 16-year-old daughter, he thought that maybe they could create a YouTube series around the talent. I guess Nick thought if Mercedes' daughter was anything like her, this could work. Anyway, as you'll hear in this interview, they were very deliberate about what their goals were. They wanted to build an audience around this brand of the Sunshine Girl and use this audience to gain access and leverage to uh, influencers in the entertainment industry. So you launch a web series onto YouTube, You build a huge audience and you use it to get meetings in Hollywood and you keep making content and pushing forward until something clicks. For the Sunshine team, it came in the offer to write a young adult book series. In fact, the third installment of their book series entitled The Sacrifice of Sunshine Girl will be released on April 4th, 2017. So at the time of the recording of this podcast, we're only a few weeks outside of the launch. So which means Paige and the team will be traveling around the country to do this book tour. Now, what Nick and Mercedes and Paige have done is to make a small Pacific Northwest production into a success. If anyone is in the area on Wednesday, April 5th at Powell's Bookstore, which is the world's largest independent bookstore and a famous must-go-see place here in Portland, Oregon. Anyway, if you're up here in this area on April 5th, Paige will actually be signing copies of her latest book. So I recommend you guys going out there and saying hello and checking it all out. Okay, so without further ado, let's learn how we can take a web series from obscurity to build an audience and then what steps can be done to get a company like the Weinstein Company to option and publish a book series from your web series and then turn it into a TV show. And I'm very honored to have both Mercedes Rose and Nick Hagen of The Haunting of Sunshine Girl here on the Film Trooper Podcast. When you made the decision, you're like, let's do this. Let's go for uh, creating a YouTube series. Was it more just like, let's just check out. Let's 
test the waters or was there a game plan? Because I, when I remember when I first met you guys, you're talking about, you looked up the, the term, the search term, like uh, haunting. Mm-hmm. So you're like, oh, okay. Right. And it's great. Cause I saw a couple of years um, ago, there was like an uh, executive at some sort of film uh, festival symposium and, t- and the woman's like, if you got haunting in your title, we're, that's everybody needs, you know, everybody's looking for something like that. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was fascinating. This is like, you know, you guys are way, you know, years before this woman talked about that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, can we get her number? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll find out what exactly it was. Well, um, I mean, I can, st- I can start uh, from the way going way back before the YouTube channel. Um, I w- always wanted to be a filmmaker, writer, mm-hmm. um, storyteller. Uh, that's always b- kind of been in my blood, even when I was going to college for something else. Um, so that was there, and I wrote this movie a while back. I think it was 2003 or so, four, um, called Dark Horizon, uh, that I had a friend uh, star in it, and his buddy financed it for um, close to $20,000. He had a bunch of money. For, he had started this uh, somewhat successful online company, but you know he was living by himself. He had this money. He's like, oh, movies are cool or whatever. So he made he he paid for the movie and we made it and it turned out okay. Um, what you guys shoot? If it's two thousand two two thousand three, what were you guys shooting on? Right it was then? a Panasonic HVX. Okay, had okay. the P two card, the big memory cards yeah, yeah. that were like uh, trillion dollars for thirty gigs or whatever. <laughs> right, they were right. super expensive. The good old days, because <clears throat> they were the only ones that could write fast enough to record HD. Mm-hmm. So. Anyway, nerd talk. Um, <laughs> so the movie turned out all right, and um, you know, but it was like same thing that had happened with other movies. You put it in a festival here or there, but like you know, I don't think you're going to get discovered out of a festival. Like even the movies that uh, you hear were discovered out of festival really had the inside track. You mm-hmm. know, with people helping um, usher them through the festival and get the right people to know about them. So, so anyway, so that we kind of floundered and. Um, the guy who financed the movie offered me a job working for his company, and they're they're an internet based company selling um, screen printing supplies. But their whole thing with the internet based stuff is like search engine optimization and that sort of stuff. And so working there, I was doing video production because basically he wanted to create a like training series for it that he could sell on DVDs on his website because they were all everything in the industry was super old. So we, we did that, but being there, that I kind of headed up their marketing department, and I started learning all this stuff about SEO and search engine optimization. And um, after being there a couple of years and learning some of this stuff, I'm like, wow, I could kind of reverse engineer this for entertainment purposes, for storytelling. And that's where you know I kind of did some searching, and um, that's where we came up with yeah, the uh, it was the keyword search, uh, reverse keyword search at the mm-hmm. time is what it was called, and found how popular Ghost was on YouTube and how much that was searched, like 50 million times a day or something. It was insane. Um, and at the time there wasn't a ton of that out there. Yeah. Um, so then, so that's kind of the, the search engine side of things. So then we kind of built something around that. And I knew, um, you know, with, with it being, uh, optimized for the internet, you'd have to continue to create content. It couldn't be a one-off kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so we wanted, you know, we wanted to be able to create something that was viable that we could do on the cheap. And we purposely stripped it down even more so. Like we could, like I had a nice camera, we had a microphone, but we were like, let's not. Do we that. knew actors. We even got, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I think we got one of the crappiest cameras like possible. Really, like it was the a flip, flip cam. cam. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But it looked good on camera. You know, it, looked, it was like this idea of like mm-hmm. you knew she was doing it. Like you could see it in the mirror, and it had like just one big red button, and it uh-huh. just worked with like this kid who looked like she was fourteen. Right, mm-hmm. it sold the illusion yeah. that it was just this girl making these videos at her house. Right, right. Yeah, I think yeah. it actually helped us. Yeah, I kind of miss the flip cam. I'm not yeah, gonna lie. Yeah. <laughs> it was a simple time. Yeah, if yeah. anyone has an old flip cam sitting around, they want to mail to me. I'll take it. I think my brother might. Yeah. I'll t- <laughs> yeah, I will one. totally take it. I loved those things. It's very, it's very interesting because uh, you did also did the web series Screen Printers, right? Yeah, we did through with them. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So that's uh, now I see yeah. the connection because right. I remember you. I saw that series kind of come up through our, you know, the friends we know. Mm-hmm. You know, pops up and like you know, I had no idea you made it. I was just like, oh, some people I knew mm-hmm. actors were in mm-hmm. it, and then all of a sudden, now I see the connection. Very cool. That was yeah. actually our production company, and that was our first foray into kind of branded content. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, that was yeah. that was specifically to tell a story in that world for mm-hmm. that company because it was about screen printing. Yeah. And so I, we actually loved doing it. It was really mm-hmm. fun. They really let us do kind of whatever we wanted and we, it was really irreverent. And 
it's kind of what Nick writes best, which, uh, you know, yeah. that, that kind of dark comedy <laughs> is just really what he does. And Stripping It Down came from, we did The Paranormalist together. That mm-hmm. was that was his his baby, and he cast me as one of the actors. And um, when he came to me with the idea for Sunshine, at the time it wasn't named, it was just, you know, girl in a haunted house. It was like, oh, it'll be a family, and da-da. I was like, you know what? After The Paranormalist, that was so hard to get five busy actors together for free yeah let's strip it down and that's when it became kind of gilmore girls meets paranormal activity it was out of necessity of what did we have access to we had access to his house we had access to a cheap camera we had access to my daughter that was the extent of it yeah yeah you know right we didn't need anything else like we uh, other things happened but it was uh, slamming doors and noises i added in in the edit you know so i was able to it was us it was the three of us yeah Yeah. the three of us for a very very long time Mm -hmm. And then, like, a great story of that is, uh, again, it was a rental that he rented uh, from a buddy of his, and his dog destroyed the bathroom door. And so before he told the landlord that he was going to change the bathroom door, we turned it into one of our literally most popular videos was they, like, right. Trapped in the Bathroom. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's we can send you a link to what it is. So you no, can I remember watching that one. Yeah. yeah, it's still one of our top videos, and it was because the dog destroyed the door. So he added the blood and, you know, help yeah, me. And, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, again, using what we had access to. I think if we'd had access to a boat, Sunshine would have been on a boat. Right. You know, it was, it was, and to this day, we still do that. We still, we borrow people's cabins and, you know, what, what do we have available to us? Um, you know, we got, right. we, we got a new, do you know what the ring is? The, the, on your door, it's a doorbell that's like a camera that you can check your, Oh. Yeah, you know, on your phone. Okay. So, like, we incorporated that into the story. The, the nice. ghost rang the ring. You know, what, what do you have available to you? That's a big part of what we do. It's fascinating. There was, um, it was like, you know, uh, Robert Rodriguez, in terms of the whole concept of like the resource-based filmmaking, like yeah. when he wrote like El Marachi, like what I have a turtle, I have a bus, I have a, a yes. Mexican town, I'll build something around that. And it's funny because you talk about Gimel Girls meets Paramount activity. I don't, I don't know if I told you because I was talking about my uh, Sony days, but you know one of my past podcast guests was Orrin Pelly, creator of Paranormal Actor- Activity, mm-hmm. and he and I worked together at Sony. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was just a a, um, a programmer. And nobody yeah. knew that he was doing this on this. He was so quiet about it. Yeah. Just in his home, he was just messing around and like just for himself to prove it to himself. Yeah. And this, and as he was getting traction, because in the po- in that interview I had with him, we went blow by blow, like mm-hmm. really what had to happen. And so many sort of, let's say, fortunate things had to break. But it wasn't like nine day. It was like over a year and a half. Oh, yeah. The process of that actually waiting to break um it was originally with dreamworks and then dreamworks had a deal with paramount and paramount and uh dreamworks split up that deal and so mm-hmm. and one of the lucky things was like one of the executives from dreamworks was now working at paramount then they took paramount activity they're like can we have that one mm-hmm. when they had nobody no nothing on in the slate and marketing mm-hmm. so they had all these marketing resources of paramount going what do we do let's get creative with this thing so it's yeah. like, you know, so many things had to happen. And to listen to his story about that, I'm just going, oh my God. It was, just, it was great to hear because he was, he was always a great guy. Mm-hmm. And to hear his hard work, his focus on that. But it's funny to see. Mm-hmm. Like, he was like, yeah, it's Gilmore Girls Paranormal Activity. Right. Now you guys got this. Now you put this in motion. Did you know anything really about YouTube, <laughs> how it worked? Or do you say, you know, I just did a search on, you know, YouTube. These are the terms. Let's, I, I figure we can maybe strip some of this stuff down. And... Where and when did you start getting rhythms of like, all right, we're, we should shoot everything like in one day or one, one week? Like how, how did that growing pains happen in terms of production and also understanding the platform that you're serving? Well, I, th- I thought I knew YouTube going in because we, <laughs> um, <clears throat> we had with that company we were posting videos online mm-hmm. and that's kind of you know what triggered this. But I clearly hadn't done my research. Like I'd done a, a little bit of looking around. Um, Quickly, I was like searched other ghost videos and found you know there was a couple dudes in their uh, mid 30s, 40s making ghost videos. One had his daughter that was in there, and um, <clears throat> but that was kind of it. But um, you know, a, a lot of it was presumptions that I had of like, well, what do I what do I see happening? It's like, well, people click off of internet stuff after like 10 seconds. Like you have to have it be engaging. Um, you know, I wanted it to feel authentic. Like it had to, I, I didn't want it to feel polished because I didn't think those things did well on YouTube. I didn't think like a corporate video did very well on YouTube. I mm-hmm. thought like this girl uh, that seemed like she was making her own video uh, would do better. So some of those were presumptions that, um, you know, ended up being fairly true. We tested the waters. We posted five, I think it was five it right was off the bat. three the first day. Three off, three off the bat. And yeah. then uh, we had a couple leading up to that. We always had kind of had the strategy of... Um, 
uh, we would shoot a bunch in one day and then we'd spread them out through the month. I think we started with just maybe one a week mm-hmm. initially. That was kind of the release. And then we went to two a week. Um, so initially there was a, you know, a strong kind of response and, and that kind of, it wasn't like we went viral or anything, mm-hmm. but it was enough of a response to know that it worked. And, and we still haven't gone viral. Going. I mean, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Th- yeah. I mean, it's not, it's never was about that, but like going back to what you were saying, part of what we did to keep it real is it's not scripted. Mm-hmm. That's all just ad lib. I mean, it's a basic, he'll say, you know, this thing needs to happen in this video, right. but really it's all just Paige, you know, our star mm-hmm. kind of saying whatever comes to her mind. And I think that's a lot of why people really responded to it, but th- that part hasn't changed. A lot of it hasn't changed. Hmm. Right. I and mean, we still use natural light. The camera's a little better, but not really. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's still not a completely high-end camera. Yeah, the the, the flavor is still, like, so it's still the same because the, the recent video that you guys just uploaded is getting ready for your book launch. The right. Book, you know, and right. to see, um, I was curious because you have like, you know, the mysterious, you know, man show up, but then the books, you know, scatter. Mm-hmm. So like, I was thinking, oh man, after how many years of doing this, you probably got some things down. Like in terms of like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, like, okay, Paige, when you grab the camera, you take yeah. off, you yeah. come over here, mess up the books. You're like, you're like it's, you know, the, the, how small the crew is. Uh, yeah, that part uh, we have figured out, definitely. Like little little tricks of, of the scare. Um, when you decided that you wanted to do this, how did you present it to your daughter, who was at 16, I think, at the time? Yeah, no, I basically just said, hey, remember that guy I worked with on that really fun, The Paranormalist? And she was like, <laughs> yeah, I thought he hated you. Oh, no, turns out he didn't. Um, I was like, hey, so, yeah, he has this idea of, like, girl in a haunted house and he thinks if you're anything like me she's like let me just stop you right there <laughs> she's like i'm just a younger prettier version of you oh my and god i said that's really true she's very humble she's <laughs> yes. very humble so uh yeah so we sat down and met with him and they chatted and she was like i totally think i can do this and she had she you know at 16 she looked about 14 mm-hmm. and she had done modeling and acting since she was about six but she tapped out at five one and she really wasn't getting very much work anymore she was hardly ever getting to audition and Mm -hmm. You know, when you're 16, but you can't play 18, there's just not a lot of work for you when an 18 year old can play 14 and especially in Portland. So we'd always wanted to work together. Uh, You know, we never got cast as mother daughter. We'd worked together before, but never as mother daughter. And we'd been casting commercials and stuff, but always with different families. And so she just thought it'd be fun. And so she was, she was all for it. She gung ho and she's really good at it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember some of those early comments from commenters just being like, this is so unbelievable. There's no way they're really mom and daughter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's what they're... Oh, some yeah. Pe- some that people was the most unbelievable that, yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. the ghost stuff. Right, right. right. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's no way they're mother-daughter. Because yeah. they want to believe in the ghost stuff, I right. guess. But yeah. So, yeah. And, and actually, that's for, for true fans um, that are listening. The reason why in the book, Sunshine is adopted is because of all of those early comments. She's not. Paige is, is really my daughter and not adopted in any way, shape, or form. Um, but that was part of it. Was the publisher was like, hey, you know, people think you don't look alike anyway. So she clearly, she looks more like her father. <laughs> so they made her adopted, and that's a big part of the story. Interesting. And a part of the lore of the sh- yeah. of it now. It's not in the YouTube at all. We don't. Yeah. But I don't think we ever even mention it in the YouTube. But in the book, and then in the forthcoming TV show, it's it's a huge part of the lore of of it of sunshine very cool it's interesting because you get user feedback that like so when you're putting this together at what point did it become sort of a like a rigid not rigid but like more scheduled like okay wait this is we're, we're seeing traction like there was like a hunch you know you mm-hmm. kind of test i'm assuming mm-hmm. and then when did it start becoming like a like it's just the work started to set in like wait how does YouTube's algorithm work? Like, what's the search? How do I you pop it? The minute you figure it out, it changes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's <laughs> like, well, like, how do I, what kind of thumbnails am I using? Like, the tagging? Like, how, and like, at what point did you start seeing it? Was it a couple months in or was it like a year in? That- I, I think we got, we got, um, I mean, for me personally, I got the response that I wanted pretty early on. So we kind of set about making a schedule. Okay. Um, but then it became about the creative for a long time. So we had a schedule, we'd cut, we'd figure out a day and they come and we'd shoot like 18 episodes or 16 episodes or whatever. And, um, there was that side of things, but, um, a lot of it was about the creative and it probably always shouldn't have been, there probably should have been more consideration because then, um, because I just don't know how well story does on YouTube. Especially in back then. Especially oh, yeah, yeah. back then. Um, so then we started looking at more of the search engine optimization and creating, we created some one-off videos that would, 
uh, that kind of fulfilled that kind of their what the algorithm needed, <clears throat> and so those did kind of well. So, you know, it began to splinter, and we be- the creative started to take kind of a back seat. Um, and then when the book deal came along, I really pushed the creative to the back seat and said, okay, the books will be more of our canon. That'll be our story. Let that live on its own as the sunshine story because we can do way more in the books that we could do on right. a YouTube video. And let the videos and everything we create for our network kind of fulfill, you know, whether it's something the audience wants to see or something that we need to create in order to get the views, that sort of thing. So it was, I mean, it was a kind of a natural process and YouTube changed their algorithm. They've changed it twice since we started mm-hmm. and it drastically affected our numbers until we figured out what we were doing wrong. What were they? And they don't tell you. Oh, they don't <laughs> tell you. Well, in hindsight, we know now. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what were they that you saw? Like when you, when you first started and you saw that there was a change and you had to adjust and then there was a second change. Um, mm-hmm. Can you remember any of those sort of details? Well, the biggest one is watch time. Um, you know, initially, initially in YouTube, it was how people responded to thumbnails and if they're clicking on their, your thumbnail. And if they commented, if they gave you a thumbs up. and Yeah, there's, I mean, there's the engagement, that sort of thing. But, you know, early on, it was the thumbnail. That's what you would see. Mm-hmm. Um, but then fairly early, like fairly from us, I think yeah. it was like... I don't know when did YouTube start, 2005, I think, and this was like, let's say, 2000, late 2011, mm-hmm. when they really started getting popular. Uh, basically, people were creating videos that had nothing to do with the thumbnail. Right. So YouTube right. figured that out, and they're like, okay, we we can't give the thumbnail as much weight. We can't get, which, are people staying on the video? Are they lasting through the video? Um, for, just, for the listeners listening, that what... I remember this being like a picture of some bikini clad girl. Right. right. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. because that was the thumbnail, we get these clicks. Yeah. And the video had nothing to do right. with that. And right. And I was disappointed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, just kidding. No, seriously. Kidding. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, initially YouTube was feeding, would continue to feed that video with that poor choice for a thumbnail because people were clicking on it. They wouldn't think, oh, people aren't responding to this video. Um, so then they changed that over. And, um, <clears throat> So then the thumbnail kind of had to match better the content of the video. Mm -hmm. And once that happened, that's when we were able to create some more of our viral videos because I could get the girl in the bikini. Not that we did, but, you know, we got we got the the thumbnail that enticed people to click Mm -hmm. the red circle around the ghost. But that wasn't just the stock image. That was literally what they see on the video. So then they're watching it and then they have the watch time and and that gets looped into YouTube's algorithm as people are responding to this video. And then two years after that, it was it's still about watch time, but it became about more about length of watch time mm. and engagement became a bigger deal. And so those videos that we had created were only a minute long. And at the time, they were a big deal for YouTube because they were people were sticking through and they were watching them longer than what a video with a poor thumbnail yeah. or a thumbnail that didn't match. But now it wasn't it wasn't 10 minutes long or thir- even 30 minutes now. People are making these 30-minute vlogs that pe- kids are sitting all the way through. Wow. And that's what YouTube is deciding uh, viewers want to see. That's, yeah. And so part of our frustration was when we were focused on the creative side, we would do really cool things. Like we got Jerry Buxbaum to let – uh, Paige hit him with a car like he's a stunt guy in town <laughs> yeah like we had this great thing that we like took all this time and all this effort to make this really great video and it did fine but I mean it didn't it didn't get us like what we'd hoped it would so then it was like okay what do we focus on so uh, you know now a lot of times our videos are pretty similar there's you know the same type of thing happens over and over again and mm. hopefully you know we can make some adjustments as it becomes more popular as the tv show happens and and all of that but it's always been about what does youtube need from us to show to show up in the search engines and yeah. that's and so it's it's not necessarily the easiest place to be creative interesting so what and when did you know um you start seeing like maybe say ad revenue coming in because i know you had that crossover like i have this full-time job but then how am i gonna when do i stop doing the full-time job and commit full-time to youtube because a couple years ago there was a lot of youtubers that were making you know some decent cash but when they changed like the their algorithm all of a sudden somebody was making whatever three thousand a month was now making 400 a month you know things like that um what was the the moment that you saw uh, th- that that change needed to happen for yourself. Like, okay, I'm going in full time on this, and I could just see a direct correlation between the amount of time that I could put into it and the amount of views that we would get. Um, and I knew, you know, I could create a, I could create 
you know, three or four times the amount of content if I was able to do it full time. So that it was kind of a leap of faith, but I felt like YouTube was headed in that direction where it was going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how much I feel that way these days, um, because the market's a little flooded. Um, but they're figuring it out and people are rising to the challenge for sure. But I remember that when that first algorithm changed, the one that you were referencing, I remember talking to somebody at YouTube and they're like, you know, nobody at YouTube knows anything. They're like, I don't know what happened. Nothing changed. We don't know because they're just, you know, 25-year-old person <laughs> out of school or whatever. Um, but I remember them giving me some examples of people's channels. It's like their livelihood just went out, flushed down the drain. And, and these people are desperately trying to figure out how to fix that problem. And they're like, I don't know how to do anything but YouTube. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I don't know how to do anything but this style of video that YouTube now decides is not relevant anymore. Right. And some of them, yeah, they totally went by the wayside. In fact, all the ghost channels that started with us that we kind of, like those guys, those guys that he was talking about, mm-hmm. none of them still do ghost videos. Mm-hmm. Some yeah. of them don't do anything at all on YouTube anymore. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and we they got were, lasted them all. And they were there kind of in that sweet spot where they were making like three or four times what we would have been yeah. making two years later when we built our numbers up to that size. Like they were making a lot of money because mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot of... The views were there, but that I don't know the you know the mix mm-hmm. of amount of total amount of videos and ad revenue was there where they were making you know twelve eighteen thousand dollars a month. Single on, a single dude sitting in his basement. Right yeah. Yeah. on on numbers that were not astronomical in today's like what you would see today. Right. You know? But I know the ad revenue is nowhere near what it was back then, so it's crazy. Yeah. But for us, it was never about trying to be popular on YouTube. YouTube was a platform that we chose to tell a story to get Hollywood to pay attention to us, which is exactly what happened. So what, where, how early on in the, the meeting of the minds that you said, did you have like a game plan? Like, let's build up this this concept, this, this story uh, and this genre. And, you know, because I know that you the book, creating a book was somewhere along the line in your plans, uh, not necessarily with the, the Weinstein Company. That mm-hmm. just, we'll get into that later. Right. But the... Where was like sort of the trajectory of like where you thought things should go or could go if you built it correctly? Um, I, from the very beginning, we had the idea of that we wanted to build an audience big enough that somebody down in LA would pay attention to us. Like that was that, always the goal. That, that was the end game. Um, you know, because I figured that from a business side that if you create an audience big enough that you're going to have value. Right. If yeah. you have an audience, leverage. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and somebody from the outside is going to say that person has value because they were able to create an audience, or they have this audience that we can tap into. That's potentially, you know, X amount of dollars for us if we can tap into it. Did you learn that from? Uh, I like, read an article about Tyler Perry, actually, <laughs> oh, okay. um, and what he was doing. He started out with a stage play, and then he was making movies, and he was creating this this audience that was this faithful audience that was coming back to him, and so people were giving him money to make movies, even though he was like a pariah in Hollywood for a long time, and people weren't considering him legit. He was totally legit making these huge movies. Um, because he had a faithful audience. He had built up an audience big enough that had value. And that stuck with me. And I thought, you know, we could do that on a smaller scale, enough where somebody in Hollywood or whatever would um, would pay attention to us. And we did. I mean, we had an agent, a literary agent, come calling. At one point, we got big enough. So And literally, yeah. she emailed the Facebook page on Halloween. And hmm. she didn't even realize it was Halloween. It was really funny. And she's like, hey, have you ever thought about doing a book? And Paige is like, a book about being on YouTube? No, I haven't. No. Mm-mm. And she's like, well, what about a book based on your adventures? And that's what started the whole thing. Hmm. And we wrote a you know traditional book pitch for a young adult book. And it went out to all of the big publishing houses and like tore a bit on it and you know all the really big ones. And then at the last second, because there's like a window of time that they can bid, mm-hmm. Weinstein Books came through and our agent you know called us up and they said, okay, you got a last minute bid. It's, it's, they're not great with books is, you know, her thought at the time. She Mm -hmm. was like, they're not known. They've never done a young adult book, but they're, you know, really legit for what you guys want. It's Weinstein books. And we just went, huh? Like Harvey Weinstein? Did you guys even know they were in the book business? No, no. We were like, you mean like Miramax? Like, like. It was just, it was mind boggling. Yeah, mm -hmm, yes, we'll take their bid. Yes, thank you. (laughs) You know, I was a fan of Tarantino and Kevin Smith and Robert Rodriguez for a long time. So it's like, I always wanted to emulate that indie film kind of model that they had come up out of. So it was crazy. Yeah. So even though our literary agent was like, Tor is really known for books. Let's do Tor. Tor really knows books. And we were like, (laughs) "Uh, yeah, we love you, but we really want to do Weinstein. Because for us, that just made sense. So then they simultaneously bid on the book and then they had 30 days to do the the film and TV 
uh, bid. Yeah, they had an exclusive 30 days yeah. to come up with a pitch for us for a... Yeah. Which originally it was going to be film, and mm-hmm. then a couple, like a year later, it changed to TV. Was so. this a sort of agreement that you guys put in place for them, or was it something like a standard that they came up with, or the agent? agent? It was the agent. Well, that, what yeah. was funny, though, is I just assumed that they did that with all their properties. If mm-hmm. I was Weinstein Books, I mean, that yeah. just made sense to me, and it turned out it was the first time they'd ever done that. They They had books before, and they've done books since, and... Um, they've been an amazing publisher, but that's not really what they're known for. I right. mean, it's just a division of Weinstein of what they do. And so th- we were actually the first for Weinstein that they ended up bidding on their own property. So that's cool. Cause I was, um, what I read in the articles, it, it sounded as if they, you know, they were wanting to venture into this space, yeah. you know, and they were definitely, um, uh, smitten by page, you know, mm-hmm. and what you guys have put together. And I, I read, I read somewhere or also heard someplace that, Paycheck was part of like Seventeen magazine or something That's like that. That's how the literary agent found That's her. That's how. Okay, yeah. so that. So yeah. because she was just doing, you guys were just building this, building, you know, and then um, she gets the call or an email about let's be part of Seventeen magazine. No, she entered. I mean, oh, like, that was right. It was a contest. Yeah, it was a contest. Yeah, yeah, right. it, yeah, they don't actually do it anymore, but it's just it was called Pretty Amazing, and she entered, and she was like, I, you know, I think what I'm doing is pretty amazing, but well, you know, whatever, and you know, she went through like. A bunch of interviews and stuff and then it just turned out she's one of the finalists and there were five girls that they sent to new york did a huge three three different uh not episodes what are they called editions of the magazine mm-hmm. had stuff about the girls in it um culmin- culminating in the final one and she didn't win but she was one of the five finalists mm-hmm. and of the five finalists two were named Paige, which is kind of random <laughs> and <right>. so <laughs> the other page is a uh, hiv advocate she was born hiv positive and mm-hmm. so she you know, goes around talking to people about AIDS and about youth with HIV and, and sort of the stigma that goes with it. And her literary agent was trying to find stuff about her for press. So she had Googled literally Page 17 magazine. Well, Paige McKenzie, our page popped up. And she was like, Whoa, wait, what is this? Because YouTubers were, that was when YouTubers were starting to do books. Yeah. Every YouTuber had a book. Yeah. So that was what made her do, that's kind of what made her aware of us. It's, so. it's wild to hear your story of just like, serendipitally oh yeah wait i can't pronounce i can't say any english words by the way uh the um but the fact that it happened because like listening to orin pelly's story about paranormal activity mm-hmm. again there's all these little things that had to happen that by chance right like the famous story where they needed spielberg's um approval uh before going forward and spielberg was watching the movie and something happened in his house that mm-hmm. scared spielberg he, he didn't finish watching the movie so it adds to the lore but for you guys this is fantastic because again it's like but it doesn't come from nothing. It's right. you, you have right. to build something. You had to build the value. You had to put it into motion mm-hmm. that sometimes these little breaks happen, but being ready for the breaks when they do happen. So Right. Uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, there's this, there's this calculation to it, but you can't ever predict exactly how that's going to come to fruition. So. Well, yeah, we didn't know books. Right. We didn't know books, but we knew we had an objective. We knew where we were headed. But how those pieces come together have a lot to do with outside factors, and you kind of have to be open to them and, and ride that wave and through line until you get to where you want to get to. Yeah. I mean, it's been a totally different path than we assume, but the end objective was still the same. Right. End objective. Well, and going back to even before the 17 magazine, mm-hmm. you know, we, after the show w- had been on YouTube for a couple of years and it was starting to get popular, and Paige was getting out of high school, and we we're like, okay, now what's the next thing? Is she going to go to art school or whatever? Yeah. We did the LA rounds. We went and like, met with everybody and, like, hey, do you want to rep? the show do you want do you know do you want whatever and one of the people we met with was awesomeness tv mm-hmm. and loved him she did like an interview with him it was great and everything so we were following them on twitter because we'd met them even though we never really did anything but an interview with them we never you know partnered with them or anything it was because she was following their twitter feed that we heard about the 17 magazine she wouldn't have even heard about it otherwise mm-hmm. so it's like all those little things that you know what we thought would happen you know when you, you always think like well maybe we'll put this thing on youtube and then i had this vision of like at Christmas, all the all these you know families get together, and some twelve year olds run out of the room screaming, and the parents are like, "What's wrong? What's wrong? Sunshine, she's in trouble!" And they're watching YouTube, and the parents are like, you know, somebody in Hollywood. Like yeah. that was like what I thought would happen. Like a janitor would see it and take it to his boss, and you know, right? Well, they that, got the early days of YouTube. The Fred, the yeah. kid that was yelling, like yeah. the dad of like Nickelodeon or something. Right. His kids are watching this, and that's when he started. To, yeah, you hear all this stuff. That's what we thought would happen. Yeah, yeah. But what's really cool about it, the way that it did happen with the books, is Paige actually loves books. She loves the literary world, and it's very girl power. Like mm-hmm. Hollywood can be very misogynist, you know, towards towards women in general, and it can be it can be a tough world for a young girl. Um, but the literary world is so girl power. Like 
everyone we work with in the literary world is women. Mm. And she just, it's, it really has been good for her. She's really loved it and loved working with, you know, working with her co-author and working with the publisher. And it actually ended up being the best thing it could have ever been. And we had no idea. I mean, we wanted to do a series of books at some point. I mean, from the beginning, it was always like, okay, let's do a comic book and a video game. And, you know, we wanted Sunshine to be a huge brand. Mm -hmm. We wanted it to be a Harry Potter type, but we didn't know it was going to go via book to TV. Yeah, yeah. So couldn't plan it. It's funny. I had to, I did a podcast episode a few back a while back called 10 Ways to Increase Your Luck as a Filmmaker." And really, what it was is to break down the scientific approach to luck, where scientists all they don't believe in luck; they believe in high probability or low probability. Mm -hmm. So the idea is like, what can you do to increase your probability? Mm -hmm. And like, what hearing your story, it's like because you've taken you built something, mm -hmm. went down to Los Angeles to to make an active uh, effort to meet and greet and then you know you're following uh, awesomeness tv mm -hmm. and then you see this probability happen so your probability was increased now hey here's a here's a, a contest let's put this in where in the timeline was i saw that you guys were then uh invited to down to la to the youtube studios you, you were doing a bunch of really great like one-offs the you know uh just with the, all the stuff they had at the set like what, what did that come after this the interview the contest or was that before? Or was it all in conjunction? Because I saw you guys go down to L.A. a few times. Um, how did that uh, transpire? Well, our first time down shooting down the YouTube Space L.A., that was before the contest. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Because well, we talked to Molly while we were down there. Well, really, yeah. here's what really happened. In, yeah. the big, in the big spectrum of things, you quit your job and uh -huh. everything happened. Right. <laughs> I mean, kind of all at once. But, yeah, no, right. we were, we had, they kind of YouTube sort of got... It's really hard to get YouTube to pay attention to you. Mm -hmm. It's really right. hard to get their attention. I was going to say, they're pretty self-involved, especially then. <laughs> yeah. So they wouldn't have really looked out on press and said, like, oh, this person's doing something cool. We Let's should check on them. them. No. They're more, <laughs> yeah, they're more algorithm-based, uh, analytics-based. So they just picked out our channel as being a successful channel in that kind of sphere of, like, haunting or ghost or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and storytelling. Storytelling. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then, um, yeah, and then they reached out to us. And we've done it. We did it. We were part of a... A beta program that never got past beta. They never did it again. Uh, but but we got cool. a cool camera out of it. That was really cool. We got a cool camera. <laughs> free we trip to LA. Times, and then we went to some of their labs. And um, it was, a, I think it, they were just making an effort to build up the use of the facility down there and the exposure. And um, I think now they're probably overbooked all the time. Like mm -hmm. we have access there. We can book time there. But we We'd have see. to book out like a couple months. A couple wow. months. And yeah, they have different sets. And it's like, what's the, I don't know. There's not. A, I mean, it's super fun. It's a great space. Yeah. Um, and we had a lot of fun with it. We, we met some cool huge people. Set like they built. Yeah. We were, we did something for Legendary, which was cool. The entertainment company and yeah, yeah. But really, when it comes down to it, it really is. He quit his job and and spent. So then we had three people whose full energy. You know, Paige was done with high school. She she forego uh, college. Okay. She got into art school, but she she deferred and she deferred again. And then after that, they just say, "Please don't say you're deferring anymore. You're just not coming." <laughs> and um, so it was it was you know I had kind of backed off acting so that I could focus on this full time. I still do a little bit, but mm -hmm. it was really all about three people putting all of their energy into the haunting of Sunshine Girl, and it did. I mean, it even if it wasn't like views suddenly spiked, it's not like not like we went suddenly viral or whatever, but just all that, I love the word synergy. It was just all of it kind of all happened that right then, all within just a few months where it all sort of clicked and it just has been clicking ever since. And even when it feels like it's going slow, like it's never actually, we're going to be called an overnight success. Right. Like, done. I, yeah, I was going <laughs> yeah. to say, I think, you know, the books are there, but people kind of look at them as kind of an afterthought. But I mean, the books take a ton of effort. Yeah. You write, write those uh, books and we did one a year them. <laughs> for three years and promote them. Yeah. So that was always kind of work in the background that we had to do to make sure that that happened. While and we run were doing the channel. The, and run the channel <laughs> yeah, and yeah. try to, yeah. So. I've watched you guys, like, I think before you even quit your job. Like, so I've seen you, when I first met you, it was just like, you made a good dent on right. YouTube as mm -hmm. a space. Um, I think we didn't share it till we had five million views. Yeah, and then we decided to share it into our kind of like network. our local. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like our friends and family knew, but like nobody went to high school with Paige. Tons of people still don't right. know. Right. You know she, we wanted to know. We wanted to. We wanted it to be something that was working on its own, not this kind of propped up with by mm -hmm. your friends and family kind of right, thing. Right. Right. So yeah, by the time we announced it, it, I I think those kind of numbers are have enough of an impact to people. who are like, wow, what are you guys doing over there? So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then I see that, and then like I, I've been following you guys. I see like the, the being invited to the YouTube space, mm -hmm. and then I see once in a while like a, a news item about you know 
pages A lot 17. of stuff we can't talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. There's all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. curious what the emotions were when when you got invited to the YouTube space. Was like, oh, that's cool. What, where in Was it all accumulating to when you just got that last minute call, like, hey, the Weinstein Company wants, wants in? Because that, to me, sound, when, I, when I talk to you, it yeah, sounded yeah. like you, you, you were like, oh, my, yep, oh, yep, drop it all. Yeah. yeah that, that's the one. Um, like, what were the emotions? Because you don't get a lot of this. Sometimes in interviews, you don't. Right. You, I'm, well, I'm trying to live vicariously or let the <laughs> audience live vicariously. Because, you know, Nick's very, well, you know, I studied this and <laughs> as everything was really great and we, we were really calculated. But the reality yeah. is, like, where's the moment of, like, Holy crap. This We've got a is... bunch of those. A lot of our moments, though, is literally Paige and I going, this is it, Nick, this is it. And he's going, could be. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, we've, had a, we've had probably a dozen times where we've thought, okay, this is the tipping point. Mm-hmm. You know, getting invited to the YouTube space. We're like, okay, finally. Because truly, yeah. if YouTube pays attention to you, you know who they promote? They're top people. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like, why, why, is, why is there another article on BuzzFeed about the top people? Like, you know, I want to hear yeah. about the smaller people or whatever. So, I mean, there's been a lot of moments where we've thought, okay, this is it. Yeah. This is it. And every time it's been, well, okay. So that wasn't the thing, you know, even when it has worked out, even when like going to the space was really great and we, you know, we learned a lot when it was nothing but positive, but it wasn't mm-hmm. that tipping point we thought it would be, you know. Um, Disney literally called us up. I mean, the, Disney. I mean, yeah. you can't, you can't, that's like right up there. And they got on a phone call. We didn't really know what the phone call was. They were like, hey, we just want to talk to Paige. So Paige gets on the phone with the head of the movie of the week division, like the Disney mm-hmm. original contents. And she literally said, and you can bleep this out if you need to, uh, we just think you guys make good shit. I'm like, Disney just said that about us? Like, can I just have a bumper sticker? Like, <laughs> that says, Disney says. You yeah, shit. <laughs> exactly. And they were like, so we want to go a little bit darker. What do you guys, do you have anything you want to pitch us? Uh, yeah, that's always the answer. Mm-hmm. Like in improv class, class, yes and. Yes. So we did. We got, we pitched them a couple of things. They actually picked our second idea and it turned in mit- to Misfits, which is now uh, okay. on the Disney Channel yeah. YouTube. You can watch watch the short there and shot that all local cast and crew with Disney money. We literally got a check from Disney. It has Mickey on it, on the check. It's pretty cool. So that that was probably my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was yeah. pretty fun when Disney was like. Well, that's been fun uh, for you too, I think. I remember seeing some photos of like behind the scenes. And I think you tagged them like the director gets to direct or something. Mm-hmm. And he's like, or something. He's oh, like, right. it's like this whole crew around you. It was really cool. Oh, yeah. it was amazing. It was a fun yeah. experience for sure. It was yeah. definitely our biggest yeah. production. Yeah, one that we managed as a production company. Yeah, because it was definitely. just our production company. Mm-hmm. And really, Disney left us alone. Once they approved the script, which was very minor notes, they were like, no, you cast it, you do your thing, you know, you, whatever. They had very, very few notes. In the end, we had to take out a couple things that we wanted to add that they thought were a little too dark, um, which I actually, you know, we'd love to do a director's cut at some point. Um, and, and we're still hoping more, that we can get to do more with that. How it's- very cool. So you have... Your deal with the Weinstein Company, mm-hmm. do the books, and then there was at that time, I think a year ago, it was an option for the TV show. Yep. Then now it's the TV show is no, yeah, it's in it's development now. Development. Yeah. But that allowed you to other people to call. So Disney yeah. calls and says, "Yes, we understand the Haunting Sunshine Girl brand is not an option. Right an <laughs> yeah. option. What else do you have? Yeah. So you're like, well, we have our production company. So just making things yeah and that's happened a couple times there's a couple others we can't really talk about there's mm-hmm. been a couple yeah, other phone calls that's like well so what else you got we have so much I mean yeah. we, we always have how, so many ideas how do you guys do you have like a are you all on the same page knowing that when those calls come in to be ready to pitch the next thing oh yeah um, how, how early on in your your process were like all of you on the same page like look oh immediately is, yeah it was yeah. weird uh-huh. yeah it was weird we're a great team it's, yeah, yeah. Right. it's weird we <laughs> have like a master list of ideas but then we also are really adept at um coming up with something new that fits a little fits that specific kind of what they're looking for or whatever because a misfits was a wholly original idea mm-hmm. um but once we got around to pitching it and talking to them i mean it's a very interesting fleshed out uh real world that we created for them and we hope they want to do more with it cause yeah we could totally go and do a tv show right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's know a, kind of an interesting you know it's an interesting little different story than what you're seeing out there so yeah we uh creatively i mean i think that that's kind of what we would have to have work and for us to be because we've been together for a while now mm-hmm. and um, we kind of sync up creatively and bounce ideas off of each other, and it, yeah, we don't, we are not very often on different pages. Yeah, if very, if one of us feels really strongly about something and the others don't, 
it, well, there's three of us, so it makes it easy. Um, it's pretty rare. Every once in a while, Paige would be like, I don't want to do that. And Nick and I will say, well, you're going to because really Paige only wants to do something if it involves Disneyland or food. So <laughs> if we just listen to what she doesn't want to do, then it doesn't always work. But, um, but creatively, it's really rarely, you know, we all bring something different to the table and we just really work well together. We always have. And honestly, even the, even the like biggest struggles that we've had, we look back and we go, we're like, it hasn't been that hard. I mean, really, mm -hmm. it's, it really hasn't been that hard. It, there's been moments of like, this is really, <laughs> I'm tired, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we work hard, we work really hard. We're up at 3 a.m. often. I mean, there, we're just, there's not enough hours in the day. But really, we've had a really good time. I mean, we're, we love what we're doing. We just treat it like a startup. We treat it just like any other startup. The volume, the consistency you guys had was impressive because it's, it's like, I'm sticking to it. We're just go, go, go. Just keep making. And well, as, don't you think sense. that? That's yeah. what I've found is the key to Hollywood. I swear, it's just, just don't stop. Yeah. Right. I mean, one of the um, groups that we met at the YouTube space was, um, their names are Jesse and Mike, and they're brothers. And they they were just kind of average in terms of views. They do comedy videos. And then just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they're like in the top 20 YouTubes now. And a lot of the ones that we met at YouTube space don't even do it anymore. Hmm. They're just, they totally have stopped. And, you know, so I think I think sometimes YouTube and Hollywood are both just literally not stopping. Yeah. Just yeah. Keep going. If, what what kind of advice would you give yourselves now, like perspective? Like it's been six, seven years now. Mm -hmm. Six years. Six yeah. years. So you're like, okay, six years when we started. From now, what, what you know now to what you knew then. Is there any advice you would give yourselves, or to give other creators are out there going, like, what am I creating, and how do you know how do you stay consistent? How do you stay focused, and all those types of things. Got anything off the top of your head? Um. <laughs> well, okay. My big thing is what I see for so many, especially young people, because that seems to be who wants to do YouTube. If you're going to do it to be famous, there are easier ways to be famous. If you're doing it to tell a story that you just really want to tell, then you have to commit to it and you have to not worry what anyone thinks. Because the great thing about YouTube is you get instant feedback. The second thing about YouTube is you get instant feedback. <laughs> I mean, Paige hears everything. She gets death threats and marriage proposals and you're fat and you're ugly. And I mean, it just, you have to have really thick skin. So if you're doing it to be famous, there's way easier ways. But if you're doing it because you want to tell a story, then. Yeah. My whole thing is if you're actually going to try to build a brand online, which is great. We're now, now people have an opportunity to do this. That's something that they could never do before. Um, and I heard a, a quote recently from Kevin Smith saying, like, if he had done Clerks now, mm -hmm. like, it would have just gone on YouTube and nobody would have paid attention to yeah. it. And I believe that. I yeah. think um, you don't. I don't know that you necessarily have to have the, the best story in the world or the most unique voice in the world. You, you have to stick with it. Mm -hmm. And I know we kind of covered that already, but I think you have to stick with it in this crowded marketplace until people are paying attention and and you know you have to consider that if you want to if you're thinking about going down the road and doing something like that jumping off on this endeavor it's like how willing are you to stick with it because most people don't mm -hmm. they they fade off or they get frustrated and for good reason yeah. um but I mean, even on our own channel we've had content creators that have created really great stuff and then they just sort of fade away and it's like, you know, you, you have the skills here, but if they didn't immediately get a million views, they're like, well, what's the point? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. we don't get a million I, views on some videos. I mean, Mercedes is talking about there's a repetition to our videos now that we make, and it's not the most fun thing in the world. It's not like I want to, as a creative person who has lots of ideas, it's not like I want to continue to slam that door down the hall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the audience has responded to that, and we're kind of building this overall brand. And, you know, granted, I could have moved on to something a while ago or whatever. And we've had a, these other opportunities to do other things creatively that have helped fulfill that. You know, we've put the books out. We did Misfits. We did these other things. Um, but, you know, when you're just starting out, I, I would say you have to stick with it. But then also you, know, you need to see the writing on the wall. If the audiences aren't responding to what you're doing, maybe, maybe you should try something else. Yeah. But so that's going to be, be your own personal kind of, you know line in the sand for yourself but if you're happy with the response you're getting then just keep doing it well even if the views it. aren't necessarily there because we definitely know about some shows that have been picked up for other things whether yeah. it's other platforms and stuff where the views aren't there but if somebody responds to it that's it's way more about that you need the right person to respond to it like i don't think high maintenance had like a no, huge amount of views yeah. on mm -hmm, vimeo mm -hmm. when when they got offered for you know right. to go to hbo and they were like you know we don't we don't was it hbo originally hbo 
The, yeah. That's where they ended up. But I know yeah. they turned it down at first because they didn't want to change. HBO wanted to make it like a pizza delivery or something. Right. And, you know, they stuck to their guns. and like, no, we're good. We're going to stay right where we are until, you know. Right. I don't want to send like some sort of sellout, creative sellout. Like I don't have a creative soul or anything. But there's, <laughs> there's a reason Tyler Perry still does the Medea right. yeah. brand, you right. know. And as a creative, we all want the opportunity to be able to make money from our work. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's uh, you hear about a lot of stories about people who was like, well, I'll do one for the brand and then I'll do my own this time around. Then I'll come mm -hmm. back to the brand. Well, Robert you Rodriguez kinda, built his whole career on that. Yeah. You think you he know? wants to make Spy Kids 4? I mean, yeah. It's probably a ton of fun, but mm -hmm. he's made a shit ton of money off of the, <laughs> yeah. those movies. Yeah. And it's good for him for doing it, you know? And now he has a choice and options and he can drop out of the Director's Guild if he wants to make yeah. Sin City, you know? Well, yeah. part of it, I think, I, I have always attributed a big part of our success to Nick letting his kind of letting his ego stick a back seat for a little while. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to look at The Haunting of Sunshine Girl and say that is what Nick Hagen does as a director, okay, that's not that impressive. I, I mean... It, right. That, <laughs> that, yeah. I mean, I I don't have... We came out of the Sunshine thing with a book deal and a TV show and development. Mm -hmm. But personally, for my personal career, I don't have a lot to hang my hat on and right. say like, yes, I'm a good storyteller. Yeah. Yes, I'm a good Just director. Just believe me. <laughs> because yeah. they, they look at that stuff and they're like, no, 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 that, that was YouTube. Let us take over. You know that that's kind of the mentality of Hollywood. So there was a, a there was a whole um, side of that. Yeah, having to check my ego or whatever, put my own personal feelings aside to build this brand, and just trying to get my foot in the door to create these other opportunities. And now I can have conversations with people and convince them that yes, I know what I'm doing, or yes, this is good for this story or whatever, where I wouldn't have had that opportunity before. So you know. Uh, Although it's extra work, like I was willing to do it because it got us this opportunity. So, well, yeah. and that he realized it was a lot easier for doors to get open with a cute 16-year-old girl. They, <laughs> you know, they yeah. were a lot more interested to hear what he had to say if she was like, hi, I'm Paige McKenzie. I'd like to introduce you to Nick Hagen. And then yeah, she just yeah. was like, do your thing. You know? right, right, right. But that's just the reality of Hollywood. And what has happened is, you know, people are always like, wow, you're so lucky, like you said, or, or um, you know, you... You, you guys, this is just, you know, this is a, an amazing thing that has happened. It's like, we did it all on purpose. This was always the plan. It, this was always, there was three things Paige said she didn't want to do. She didn't want to move to LA. She didn't want to audition. And she didn't want anyone to tell her to lose weight. That's what she cared about. <laughs> so awesome. she has, she has now done stuff for Weinstein and for Disney. She did not move to LA. She has not had anyone tell her to lose weight and she has not auditioned. Yeah. So, you know, we, Nick and I and our families, we don't want to move from Oregon. Uh, his, he's Washington, but that doesn't count. <laughs> we don't want to leave the Northwest. We, yeah. we live here. We are Northwest filmmakers. This is where we're based. We'll, we'll go shoot the TV show. You know, we're mm -hmm. trying to convince Portland is the place to be. We're really hoping, but, you know, there's only so much we can do about that. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's our reality, and that's what we cared about. We wanted to tell good stories from the Northwest. That was our, that was our rule, and that's what we did. So, I mean, I don't want anyone to think like what we've done – it's special. It's really cool, but it really is. Anyone can do it. It could be replicated. It and, and we'll help you. I mean, yeah. like yeah. we've mm -hmm. offered. You know, right. if it, I had more free time, I'd replicate it again. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, telling a different story. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there you go. Awesome. There's so much more I, I, I would love to talk to you guys about, but we'll maybe I'll come back and see how after the TV show. Is maybe after the, a press release comes yes. out, we can come give you a few more details. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. You know, all those dang NDAs. <laughs> so, yeah, but no, this has been fun. Thank you, Scott. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Scott. So that concludes my interview with Mercedes Rose and Nick Hagen, co-creators of The Haunting of Sunshine Girl. Again, if you're in the Portland, Oregon area on April 5th, go to the live signing at Powell's Books to meet Paige, Mercedes and Nick, and tell them Scott from Film Troop sent you. So <laughs> it uh, should be pretty fun. Now, what were the big takeaways? Well, I really like the idea that purposely stripping down the production to make things doable in order to crank out volume was very interesting to me. I mean, a lot of web series creators try to shoot their series like a fully produced TV show, and that takes too much work to sustain without the money. But by keeping it stripped down like The Haunting of Sunshine Girl did, they were able to focus on audience building. Then take that leverage and actively pursue companies in LA. And because they had a plan and a vision of where they wanted to go, when that surprise call came in, well, they were ready for it. They were preparing for success. Readying yourself for success, I think, is pretty key. And lastly, they had consistency. Staying focused and just producing content. And they still produce content to this day. 
So anyhow, I really hope you got a lot of value out of this episode. And if you did, please think about leaving a rating and review over on iTunes for the podcast. Just go to filmtrooper.com forward slash iTunes and any ratings and review would be you know greatly, greatly appreciated. And of course, don't go away empty handed because if you're stuck trying to make your film right now, then I invite you to get a free gift over at freegearguide.com and you can get an equipment list of, of everything that I use to make a feature film for $500 without a crew. Again, that's at freegearguide.com. That's it for now. I'll see you next time. Film Trooper, filmmaking freedom for the independent.